This week's topic is image maps, also known as imagery. And we are going to be looking at this in two parts. I'll be covering both of these in this screencast. Uh, and so part one will focus on a general introduction to remote sensing and then a focus on aerial imagery. Um, there's a video, a YouTube video that will give you a little overview that you can click on from inside of this lecture presentation. So when we talk about remote sensing, we're talking about the observation of Earth from above. Here we're talking about remote sensing in a mapping sense. Remote sensing is also used in other fields, including things like medicine. But for our purposes, observing Earth from above. And uh, this is going to be something that uh, you know, historically has been done from airplanes, but now is uh, commonly done from satellites, although uh, airplanes and even towers and other um, methods are used to uh, gather these types of imagery. There are two essential types, um, active and passive, and we'll see some examples of these in the coming slides. So uh, remote sensing is a really important source of data for GIS. It provides a perspective on various biological, physical, and human elements at different scales, including very broad scale. Um, you know, the West Coast region, for example, can be captured on a single image. Uh, it's relatively fast and expensive compared, uh, inexpensive compared to field surveys. Um, allows for remote access to areas that you might not be able to get to otherwise, and it allows for repeatable interpretation of things on the ground. So um, image maps, uh, large-scale image maps, are commonly taken from aerial photography, what we call fixed-wing aircraft. Um, you'll remember the distinction between large and small scale. So we're getting a relatively small area, but lots of detail. And aerial uh, orthophotography is an important concept because it corrects for relief. Um, and we'll see an example of that here in a moment. So for example, the USGS uh, DOQQs are a common format that are widely available. Okay, so when we're looking at um, imagery, uh, we have the advantage of seeing physical patterns, but we do have uh, disadvantages in that uh, they're not always shown to scale. We have some uh, cultural boundaries that may not be shown, um, geographical references and so forth. Typically, these are raw images that are not yet classified, requiring some interpretation on the part of the viewer. So we're going to be talking about various platforms, and the platform will host a sensor, such as a camera or other instruments. And they may be uh, satellites in space or um, airplanes, uh, balloons. You see the picture of the balloon here, towers on the right-hand side, you see. And the main objective here is vertical perspective of the terrain in contrast to an oblique perspective. Uh, an oblique perspective would be something that you might see out the window of an aircraft, but unfortunately it doesn't lend itself uh, well to measurement, uh, as does um, vertical imagery. Okay, so we're going to be um, distinguishing between airborne sensors and platform sensors, or excuse me, spaceborne sensors. Um, so airborne, you know, aircraft or an unmanned aerial vehicle or a helicopter versus uh, spaceborne sensors that are mounted on satellites. Okay, so some of the characteristics that distinguish the airborne versus the satellite or the spaceborne platforms. Orbit is obviously um, a key consideration if you're talking about satellites. All right, let's focus a little bit more on airborne sensors. Um, I will be asking you uh, a lot of detail on uh, the specifications and so forth, but um, 
Aerial photo pairs, uh, commonly 9 by 9 inches, allow for stereographic viewing. And these are typically mounted. Uh, this is actually a camera mount that has uh, some kind of a gyroscope that allows it to stabilize the camera and uh, maintaining that vertical perspective. Few views of different types of aircraft that are used for this purpose. Okay, increasingly we are moving into uh, digital imagery rather than film, which was previously used. The result, of course, is um, going to be uh, pixels, digital pixels, as opposed to an analog uh, visible view, which will give us a few different uh, options in terms of how we can use the resulting imagery. Okay, well, when we talk about black and white photography, we're talking about uh, panchromatic, which uh, stands for all colors. It actually turns out that it is represented in a black and white format uh, because you're able to get a higher resolution, a clearer image, um, when it's represented in black and white format, even though um, panchromatic in this case means all of the visible uh, colors. We'll be seeing in a moment that relates to um, the wavelengths uh, that we deal with. And um, I guess I should offer a little caution here in the sense that uh, this obviously can be fairly technical and fairly involved. So some of these technical specifications are not so much the focus of this class. If you go through the GIS certificate, you'll learn more about these things in um, the remote sensing class that we offer. But we could talk about things like the distribution of wavelengths and the response to different elements in the atmosphere in terms of determining uh, what the sensor will pick up. Um, so we can look, for example, at different um, wavelengths. So down here at the bottom, you see different wavelengths. This is actually getting a little bit ahead of ourselves in the sense that this is dealing more with um, satellite-based uh, multispectral uh, mapping, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. But true color photography kind of started in the 1930s. Um, and uh, as I indicated, uh, the clarity is not as good as it is on the panchromatic. So that's part of the reason that aerial imagery is oftentimes seen in, uh, in black and white format. Obviously, color gives you some options, uh, capabilities that you wouldn't have if you were viewing things in black and white. Okay, color infrared. Um, this is uh, actually a non-visible part of the wavelength spectrum. So this allows us to uh, discern certain things on the landscape, especially vegetation. So this is used extensively in forestry and other applications. The red on this image is going to be the vegetation. Okay, so large-scale aerial photos are typically taken at an elevation of around 10,000 feet, and you have a certain flight line, and you have these overlapping images, which allows for the, the uh, viewing of stereo vision. So you can see the overlap that's provided here. Okay, uh, again, we're getting, uh, we're shooting for what's called a central perspective, but what you'll notice is that as the camera is uh, discerning the features on the ground, that as you move further away from what's called the nadir of the aircraft, directly below the aircraft, as you move away from that, you get distortion. You can see how B is larger than A, so uh, if you're looking at a tree, for example, straight down, uh, it's going to look very different from a tree that is uh, skewing away from the aircraft. And so one of the things you want to be conscious of is the need to correct for um, those kinds of distortions. Okay, so the uh, U.S. Geological Survey is an important source of aerial imagery dating back to the 1940s. And so... Uh, there are various websites where you can access historical imagery.
Okay, we can look at uh, lower altitude aircraft, aerial imagery. Um, again, a trade-off between the area covered and the amount of detail that's going to be present. Okay, again, uh, we want to be conscious of the issue of distortion. Um, the principal point is what's called the, is the center of the image, and that's going to be the place of minimal distortion. Again, some of these things you'll just want to be familiar with in concept. Okay, so... Um, the leaning of buildings is a phenomenon that's called relief displacement. Here, relief refers to difference in elevation. You can see the leaning of, in this case, the Washington Monument in this picture. Uh, and so this is something that uh, may require some correction. And one approach to that correction is through what are called uh, orthophotos, or uh, there's actually a, a typo on the slide here that, that should read uh, ortho photo uh, or ortho photo maps. And the correction of uh, is applied, especially in the relief distortion mentioned in the previous image. And so ortho photos are geometrically corrected and will give us a better view of what we're working from. Okay, so when we're working with our GIS nowadays, we have a wonderful selection of imagery, the um, spatial resolution, the clarity of the imagery that we have to work from has been increasing and improving all the time. And so this is something where we'll be able to uh, take advantage of this as a source of data, not only for viewing and for producing map, but also from extracting features through a process known as digitizing, where we would come through and, say, trace over the tops of the buildings. Okay, so again, we can talk about um, the process of digitizing of maps um, and in this process, we're going to be identifying and mapping features that appear on photos. And we'll use characteristics of the objects observed, such as shape, color, and texture. And there's a wide variety of different applications for this. So we might be looking at trying to uh, figure out the acreage on farmlands. We might be uh, digitizing geologic or soil types. Uh, forest types are commonly mapped this way, uh, but also human features such as buildings, roads, trails, and other similar types of features. All right, that's the end of part one of the lecture. I'm going to end it here and do a second version for our viewing of satellite imagery.